Welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. I'm Dan Thomas, joined by Ali Moreno and Stevie Nickel. Gab Marcotti will be joining us shortly. Plus, Don Hutchinson with us a little later on. Today would have been the Merseyside derby. We'll be talking to him what it was like to play for both Everton and Liverpool. Stevie is not happy with Hercules Gomez Ooh. after he compared his coaching style to Diego Simeone <laughs> uh, on yesterday's show. We'll get his reaction to that. But as we do every day, we start today's show by taking you through the latest news regarding how Corona virus is impacting on football around the world. You know most of those. However, the breaking news today is that the Bundesliga uh, will suspend their matches until April the 2nd. Of course, UEFA meet tomorrow to decide the future of Euro 2020 and the Champions League. We'll discuss that a little later on. But first, let's focus on Germany because some interesting quotes from their chief executive who came out and said, tens of thousands of jobs are at stake We've reached a point where Bundesliga has to admit, yes, we are manufacturing a product, and if we no longer manufacture it, then we cease to exist. Uh, Gab Marcotti, is this as serious as he's suggesting? Look, it's obviously a serious situation for, for the Bundesliga. Uh, it's a serious situation for, for anybody who produces content. Um, uh, but you know what? I think this is also a fair amount of, of posturing, of trying to get help from, uh, uh, from the Federation, uh, from the government. Um, the reality is German clubs, like all clubs who aren't playing football, uh, will face a cash flow problem simply because they're not, they're not playing games. And so um, while the league is suspended, there isn't cash coming in and they still need to pay, need to pay salaries. Uh, but I also think, you know, there is a bit of a sky is falling, not in terms of the seriousness of the pandemic, obviously, but in terms of, of the threat to the German game. Uh, a lot of this is predicated uh, when they make the, the, their, their, their projections on the fact that television companies aren't going to pay up because there's, they're, they're, they're not showing games. Well, that remains to be seen. Um, that's one for the lawyers. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, leagues also have insurance tied with these, these contracts. We are talking about an act of God. We talk, are talking about force majeure here. Um, but obviously, from his perspective, he wants to protect his business uh, as much as possible. I think we'll, we'll have a much clearer picture uh, going forward about whether these games have to be canceled mm. uh, and never played again or, or postponed into the summer with a possible postponement uh, of the Euros. So, yeah, it's a blow, but you know what? Look around you. Look at the stock market. Look at what's happening. It's a blow to everybody. Uh, that leads us into the next question, which is looking ahead to that meeting tomorrow, of course, Gab. What are we expecting to learn after it concludes? I think there's no question that there's a strong impetus towards moving uh, Euro 2020. I think it's what the majority of the stakeholders want. Um, I can't imagine really all but a, but a handful of people being uh, being against the principle, uh, people want it, want to be able to wrap up their leagues, and they figure they've really got no shot if if they have to wrap everything up by the end of May. But if you have until June thirtieth, you may have a chance. UEFA as well want to be able to wrap up the Champions League in in some shape or form. Now we have no idea if the epidemic uh, is going to allow us to do that, but they want to be in the running. They want to have the possibility of doing that so that you can get some kind of, I don't want to say a neat finish, but at least a clean finish to all these leagues and then move forward into next season. A lot of speculation about how they're going to conclude the Champions League gap, uh, maybe a neutral venue for the final knockout stages. Is that something that feasibly might happen? I think it's, look, I think they're going to listen to, to any proposal right now. One proposal, which is, Gaining steam is uh, obviously you need to go and finish the round of 16 in the Europa League and Champions League. Uh, then maybe the quarterfinals, one-legged, uh, neutral venue. And then uh, perhaps you look at the Champions League final, having sort of a final four type scenario where you play the semifinals uh, and the final, you know, within three, four days of each other. Uh, look, UEFA very mindful that they're going to have to reduce the number of Champions League fixtures, which means broadcasters are going to take a hit for that. But it, that, that there, there has to be give and take between them and the domestic leagues because domestic leagues, most likely, most of them, won't be able to, to play out all their uh, remaining fixtures. It's all speculation, mm. obviously, uh, at the moment. But regarding that plan for the Champions League, it seems sensible, doesn't it? It does. And if I'm in that 
committee that is presenting these options as a possibility when they go and discuss this on, on Tuesday, <laughs> the one thing that I would say to that committee is, look, we're going into a beehive right now. We're going to have to deal with all sorts of different federations and different people who have different interests and they're looking out for their own league and their own situation. And yet we have to find a solution that we can all live with. And so it doesn't have to be a perfect solution because there are no perfect solutions in this problem. Yeah. You have to find the one solution that you, could, that you think is the least bad. It, of all the bad possibilities, which one is the least bad? Mm. Which one is the one that we can all live with? Which one is the one that is a, it's a give and take, but we can find a middle point, a middle ground where everybody can say, you know what, let's go after that. Something like that final four that you just mentioned, is, it is feasible, it is realistic, and it is indeed a, a, something that people can get excited about, something that we haven't seen before. Maybe we, we're making a positive out of a negative. Maybe we're trying to get the best solution that we yeah. can with the circumstances available, and I do think it's reasonable. There has to be some give and take, obviously. Yes, and I, I think what you'll find, and certainly everybody on the, the committee of UEFA and all the other boards, you'll find out all the people who are interested in the big picture and all the ones that are just looking out for themselves, that will become abundantly clear. And hopefully the good guys outweigh the bad guys yeah. and they do use common sense and they do come to an, an, an agreement that, that is for the best for everybody, not just for certain teams. Because that's pretty much what's happened in European football for years. It always seems to be the big names and the big teams either get away with things or, um, you talk. You talk about right now with Manchester City. We all think that they're going to get away with this mm. because they have the money and because of the size of the club. That this will pull everybody together, no question. Don Hutchinson is with us as well. Don, does this resolution for you make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think the noises um, in the UK on the radio stations uh, that think that's going to happen tomorrow, they're saying that everything is on the table. So. That's including suspending the season, uh, finishing it late. Uh, they're, they're, they're sort of saying, look, we're going to have a conversation and everything is, everything is on the table, if you like. So we're going to have the conversation to see how we fix this. I, I agree with the chaps. I think, in, in my view, I think the season has to be finished. I don't think you could call the season off now and, and anoint Liverpool champions. It wouldn't seem right. Um, likewise with the teams at the bottom of the league. Likewise with the teams throughout the divisions. I just don't think that sits right. I think somehow we've got to finish the leagues. Um, and if that means we lose um, the Euros, then um, so be it, really. Disappointing, but it has to be done because it's a very sensitive issue. Go on, Gab. I just want to make clear, uh, UEFA aren't at any point going to tell leagues how, how they're going to finish and what finish a league uh, means. There's people here in England, including Greg Dyke, the head of the FA, who says that you have to finish the league and you have to play out every single fixture, and that might take us through to, to August, but so be it. I Personally, I think that's an absolutely demented idea, but you know what? UEFA aren't going to get into that. UEFA are simply going to tell leagues, listen, by June 30th, you need to have everything wrapped up. If you want to if you want to play in next season's Champions League or Europa League, July 1st or July 2nd or whenever it is, you have to give us who's who's playing in the Champions League, who's playing in the Europa League, and that's it. The rest of it, you can go and finish your league in 2029 for all we care. We're not going to get involved in that. People in England want to keep playing until Kingdom Come, as Wayne Rooney has suggested, they're free to do that. If people elsewhere want to have either either some kind of mini league or playoff to wrap up uh, wrap up the league, or they can fit all their fixtures in, then th they can they're free to go and do that. But I think the message that has to come from European football is that as far as next season's Champions League is concerned, we move on, and that means early July you have to submit your names. Pick them any which way you want. Pick them out of a hat if you like. But don't give us this, well, our league doesn't finish until August nonsense. Uh, if you want your league to keep, keep going until August, that's fine. We're not going to be involved in that. You give us the names July 1st if you want to play. But then you could have a genuine power struggle, can you, Gab? For example, if the Premier League uh, say... They, they... Go on. <laughs> there's, there's no power struggle. There's no... I mean, honestly, this isn't something that anybody can entertain. Nobody in the world is thinking about playing leagues until August, apart from people like Greg Dyke and his ilk here in England, um, because there are different climatic conditions. There, there's different situations throughout Europe. But if they want uh, to, Gab, they can, can't anybody. they? For example, the Premier League oh, will be yeah, like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, we pay these players, and if we want them to play up until August, mm -hmm. then that's the way it's going to be. Then, 
then they're absolutely free to do that. The only thing that they need to do, though, is if they also want these guys who they pay to play in the Champions League and get a slice of that pie, then July 1st or July 2nd, I mean, in any case... Tim, the week before that cup final for the league, and, of course, that FA Cup final, we ended up pipping them as well, so... Yeah. That was the 3-1 I was saying before, wasn't it? That's the rush goal that hits the camera in the back camera and knocks it corner. over. Yeah, it's absolutely perfect. Now, what's interesting about this that most people won't know is what happened after the game. Mm. Well, it's, it's kind of a typical situation where people who are not football people make decisions. And the politicians in Liverpool decided that regardless of what happened, both sides would travel back together and would go on the parade in Liverpool together. Ah, so, yeah. <laughs> so both teams got mixed up with the husband, the, the, the players and the wives. Right. You know, half our team was on one plane, half ours was on the wrist plane. The same with them. So, of course, we're, we're still hung over from the night before after winning. Yeah. And they're, of course, they're, you've got to scrape them off the floor. But then we get back to Liverpool Airport. We get on a bus. They go to the parade and we've got the league and we've got the FA Cup. The second bus, which is about 40 yards behind us, is the Everton players with, their, again, their heads down, and they have to go through half a million people in Liverpool, split <laughs> all between, between Liverpool fans and Everton fans, out. and they had to go all the way through Liverpool. Wow. And of course, we're like this. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Trophies and everything. Hey! They, were all, they were all like that. Yeah, how's it gone? How intense is the rivalry, Stevie? How would you describe it? Do you know what, it's, the Merseyside rivalry is, it, it's like a family at war, is what it is, for a period of time. It's like two brothers or a brother and sister having an argument, and then eventually it's like back to normal. Right. That's what it is. It's yeah. not, it's not the, the vitriol and the hatred of a Liverpool Man United. Yes, there's that, there's that desire to win, but it's like a family thing. It's not, it's not, it's, yeah. There's no hatred in it whatsoever. And it's not like a Celtic Rangers rivalry. No. You haven't got the political, the religious edge to it either. There is... I, I, don't, I don't believe, and maybe Gab, of all people, if there is one, will tell me, I don't believe there's another derby in the world right. where both sets of fans actually sit intermingled all mm -hmm. the way around the stadium and there's never any trouble. Uh, Don, as I mentioned before, of course, knows what it's like to play for Liverpool, but... For Everton as well. Quite a unique factor. There he is. Oh, he's diving is what he's doing. I know I die when I see one. <laughs> um, Don, what was it like playing for both teams? How much stick did you get from, from, Ever well, from Liverpool fans when you went to Everton? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't actually too bad. Um, my memories, um, I don't know if Stevie played in the game in uh, 92. I was playing for Liverpool at the time. And I don't know if Stevie played in the game when Mo Johnson and Peter Beardsley scored for Everton and they beat us 2-1 at Goodison. Uh, and then obviously you had the 4-4, the famous 4-4 when Kenny resigned days later. But my selfish memory, and Ali will probably like this one, got on a selfish tangent, was I am the last Everton skipper to take his side to Anfield and win. And that was in 1998, 22 years. Wow. It's not been good for Everton. In 22 years, I've not won at Anfield. Scandalous. You know what Don does, does whenever they go and play at Anfield now? He is rooting against Everton. Yeah, of yeah. course, because he can still, <laughs> He's still the guy. He can still I'm still the captain. Yeah. Who do you support, Tom, when they face off against each other? Oh, no, massively on the fence. Rubbish. Mm. You must massively have someone that you support. No. If you had to push me and I really had to lean towards one, it would be Everton because I captained Everton. So I've got a oh, real... You know, <laughs> I, love my, I love my time at Liverpool. <laughs> No, I did. I loved my time at Liverpool, oh. but I was a youngster. I was a teenager. I didn't know what I was doing. Stevie will vouch for that. Then when I got older and I got a little bit more wiser and more responsible, um, I captained Everton for... Well, I was there for four years, so I think I captained them for about two years. So, yeah, if you, if you had to push me and you really did, I'd lean towards Everton. And, and did yeah, you know that they went into Anfield and won when he was did a captain? Did you boys that Don, Don uh, used to captain Everton? Yes, yes, yeah. he was Have, you, have you heard that? I'm, su I'm surprised <laughs> about that. I thought he would have said Liverpool. Yeah, well, of course you would. <laughs> uh, of course, <laughs> Gab, now in charge of Everton, is your best friend, Carlo Ancelotti. There was a lot of excitement when he came in that maybe the fact that with his record, he can come in and lift this club to the giant status that, of course, they have the ambition to be. He hasn't exactly set the world on fire, has he? Uh, five wins out of what? Let's do some maths. 12? That's 12, yes. Yeah, five out of 12 since he was appointed uh, the new coach. 
Is this the start of something, Gab, or is something that will end in tears pretty soon? Look, I, I made the point that when he arrived, his record really becomes pretty meaningless because this is a job unlike really any that he's had in the past 20 years. Every team that he's that he's managed thus far has been uh, has been a team that that you know was right at the finish line, and he was there just to get them over the line. Whereas Everton are 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 a rebuilding job, and they're a building job that needs to take place. I think largely on a shoestring because of all the money that was spent in recent years and and the wages and whatever else. And FFP applies to Everton as well. So. I know he's enjoying his time there. I think actually the results are, are slightly better than the way you put them, notwithstanding their horrendous defeat to uh, uh, to Chelsea, um, okay, what, two, 10 days ago. Uh, but, you know, if he succeeds at this, he will have succeeded doing something he hasn't done in a very, very long time. Just last point on this with you, Don. When Everton came in, was there ever any doubt with regards to whether or not you're going to join the club because the fact you've been at Liverpool? No, I was actually desperate to join Everton because I was at uh, Sheffield United at the time who were in the championship and my previous manager was Howard Kendall who left uh, Sheffield United for Everton. So I was actually on the phone to him every other day. Please, can you take me? Please, can you take me? Please, can you take me? And he did. He, uh, he took me alongside Carl Tyler, Mitch Ward and one or two others. So I, was, uh, I couldn't wait to get started there. And Ever Evertonians were, were brilliant because they knew sort of what type of player I was. I wasn't, you know, going to dangle a leg or be a fancy Dan number, number 10. I was going to put my foot in and get stuck in. So I was quite confident um, they would take to me. Was then captain would, material. Then, yeah, he would earn the captaincy. Yes, yes. Captain, two years, captain, two years captain, yeah. apparently. Uh, over on Extra Time on the, our YouTube channel, as always, we answer your questions. Be sure to check it out. Real Madrid apparently very interested in signing Asado Mane. Of course, what a revelation he has been since making that move, really, to the Premier League. Of course, great for Southampton, even better for Liverpool. On yesterday's show, Gab made the argument that out of the three, maybe it should be Mane who you could sell because you can get the most money from him, for him, Stevie. That's only any good if you're bringing in Timo Werner. Well, or somebody in... like Timo Werner. So you could do that, Unfortunately, you? there aren't many around. Well, there's a Timo Werner around. <laughs> but what if he wants to go elsewhere? He doesn't. He said, you know, he likes Liverpool, doesn't he? Right, He's excited that, about that. Oh, yeah, so it's done then. It's a done deal. Well, no, it just seems well, weird. Exactly. That, well, don't say that, that as if it's done. It's weird that Timo Werner is the done. way you're speaking this. is if it's done. That's what you're mentioning. That's exactly your tone. Oh, it's done. Timo <laughs> Werner's. But oh, Timo Werner said he wants to go. But well, guess the... what? There was a guy called Mbappe who wanted to go to Real Madrid, who told everybody he wanted to go, and he ended up at PSG. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you started well, okay. it. You started You're the it. one who started with Timo no. Werner, which surprises me. So, anyway. You put him on the same level as Sadio Mane. If you're going to get 140 million for Sadio Mane, mm -hmm. and you have somebody like Timo Werner, available and coming in and is going to be there, right. then I think you can take the chance. Oh, wow. If I had the choice, <laughs> I would rather sell Salah, right. keep Manny, and have Timo Werner on the other side. Right. But the truth is, if it's, if it's 140 million yeah. and you pay half of that for Timo Werner, then I think that's good business. Oh, wow. Gab? Well, yeah, no, I mean, and I'm sure they'd, they'd rather sell Divock Origi for 300 million. But I think the, the, the reality is I don't think you're getting $140 million for, for Salah. And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that Liverpool have to sell or whatever. I'm just saying that of the three, and the question originally was in the context of Real Madrid, Sadio Mane is looked at as the surest thing, I think, by clubs on the continent. The guy who's easiest to drop into a team without you having to, to go and, and, and adjust the team uh, to the way he plays. I think beyond that, we're in agreement. Uh, Mane turns 28 uh, next month. He's by no means old, but the reality is Mane, Firmino, and Salah are all the same age, and you don't want three guys who all play in the same position all getting old at the same time. So I think that was the impetus behind it. What does a former Everton captain make of all oh. of this? Uh, let's hear it. Sado Mane, what do you reckon, Don? 140 million use after that for Timo Werner. Would you take that? I'm just checking my armband at the moment to see if it's still there. <laughs> yeah, it's still there. 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I disagree with Gab. I wouldn't. Um, Gab's right in, in the fact that the same age. Uh, but it's Mo Salah that I watch every single week. And his numbers are astonishing. Don't get me wrong. And you can't take that away from Mo Salah. But I think Stevie said um, a couple of weeks back when we were on the show talking Champions League just before the Atletico Madrid game, you watch Mo Salah and the guy does genius things, but he does the most basic things so bad, it's untrue. He can't pass a ball yeah. five yards. He seems to keep playing this ball where he tries to not make everyone at the same time from when he's on the whichever side he's on. If he's coming off the right flank, he comes in on his left, tries to play it into a striker for a body of players. It's never, ever on. And you watch him and you go, surely this, surely this has been coached. Surely Jurgen Klopp and his coaching staff have tried to coach Mo Salah. And he does the basic things really badly. Yeah, his numbers are frightening and he scores a ridiculous amount of goals in the Premier League and in the Champions League. So I would disagree. I would think if you're going to sell anyone and you had to sell anyone, don't get me wrong, but, I wouldn't sell any if I was Jurgen Klopp. But if yeah, but... one was to go... And you offered me Mo Salah for someone like Jaden Sancho, I maybe would take that swap. <laughs> Go on, Gap. Yeah, of course you would. But, but that's not the point. The point is who is the most well, saleable the point. asset? Who will get you the most money? Other people can watch Salah too, and they notice what you notice about Don, uh, uh, what Don Hutchinson notices about <laughs> Salah as well. That was the whole point of the question. Of those three guys, you will get the most money for Sadio Mane. Uh, relative but that's a ridiculous so argument. Sure, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a ridiculous argument. Just because someone's valued more doesn't mean they're going to be what, the one that goes out the door. I, I'm not saying that they're going to sell this one or they're going to sell that one. But I'm saying is, out of those three, you can get $140 million for, but possibly, according to the story, for, for Sadio Mane, you're not going to get anywhere near that for Mohamed Salah. And if you're trying to you, and if you're trying to, to to sell a guy like Salah on his wages, there's a very limited number of clubs that he can go to and the next tier down of clubs can't afford probably more than 40 50 million and I think even you wouldn't sell Salah for 40 million. Uh, the transfer news web scrape is busy over the last few days. Be sure to check it out over on the website. The all-time greatest coach of New England Revolution. Well deserved. Well deserved. We thought that would be a nice segment where we could maybe say some nice things about Stevie. Which I did. Just what Hercules Gomez uh -oh. said. He didn't. There's only one Stevie Nickel. Alejandro could, could attest to this. You played against those New England teams and maybe necessarily didn't have the best team in sort of uh, where it's a very beautiful style of play, but they were the most difficult teams to play against. Every player knew what, they, what that team was about. They knew who they were playing for. They had that Stevie Nickel DNA to them. The most difficult teams you would ever play would be those Stevie Nickel teams for sure. Mm. Sounds a bit Simeone-esque, Stevie. <laughs> well, that was you, what you said. <laughs> it sounded like it, he was struggling out to be nice, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, to be fair... He was searching. Half of our team would have played in absolutely in any team in the league, mm -hmm. at least. And he's talking about not playing football. Let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to fight, yes, our teams would fight you. Right. And if you wanted a game of soccer, yes. then our teams would outplay you. Right. Uh -huh. Just go, go, look at the, go and look at the goal records. Right, what do the goal records yeah. say? Well, the goal Steve, records show you. had some records that you <laughs> well, looked unless, up. Unless you play football, you don't score goals. And right. if you look at the goals records, ours yes. is way up there over a period of four or five years, oh. averaging more goals than anybody else. It was three years before we went on screen. <laughs> yeah. Now it's gone up to four or five years. Hey, well, I started off. <laughs> everything, everything you got, you deserved. Uh, Every one of you. Everybody yeah. loves playing with this thing man. They deserve. All thing. right, then. That's it. Make sure you stay tuned for Extra Time coming up next. Welcome into Extra Time. It's the question that everybody is asking as we kick things off. Is Craig ever coming back? He's been on vacation well, for a long time. Well, it's been a week. No, it's been longer than a week. What day is today? <laughs> Today's Monday. Hey, right. time flies when you're having fun. So it's been ten days. <laughs> ten days. Time flies. That's quite a long time. He was away for five weeks last year. So all right, this is a piece of cake. But you play golf with him. He's still alive. He's still He's good. Still, still happy. Swinging. Yeah, happy. Happiest man alive on a golf course. Of course. What would it be like when he comes back here? Oh, not very happy. No. <laughs> uh, if league seasons are to resume at a later date, how long do teams need for training before they're ready for matches? Ooh. Mm. 
Well, clearly you can't do a normal pre-season. Sure. But again, what you'd have to realise is that everybody's going to be in the same boat. Okay. So no team is going to be fitter or quicker or stronger than anybody else because whatever time period it is, they'll all have the same time. And I imagine the players are still working out. Yeah. It's still and yeah, but it's a, it's a different fitness altogether. Well, yeah. Right. But you're going to be pressed for time. So you can't be like, hey, let's take a couple of weeks to get ready. No, I think yeah. once they decide we're going to go, we're going to go and then the players will be expected to be in some sort of fitness right. enough for them to put together a performance on 90 minutes on the weekend. Go on, Gab. No, it's a good point you make about the players working out. Uh, there's been a whole gaggle of videos of players uh, uh, filming themselves working out at home. I think what not everybody realizes is that uh, certainly as far as players in, in parts of Spain are concerned and players in Italy, these people are confined to their homes. So it's not like hey, some people have home gyms and mm. whatever else. Uh, other people do not. And, um, uh, and, and, and so they've had to either bring in exercise equipment where they can um, but, you know, it is very, very up and down and, and, and very different what, what people can actually do on their own. Some people have swimming pools, others do not. For Ali, is anything ever less than 100%? I'd love to hear a 76% a penalty. <laughs> well, a penalty is either a penalty or not a penalty. Yeah. So it's either 0%, Zero. or <laughs> yeah. 100%. Sure. However, for who's this person? Tim, for Tim, just for you, Tim. Yeah. Just because we're in a tough, tough situation nowadays, <laughs> yep. and I just want to lift your spirits. Seventy-six percent. Just for you, Tim. Doesn't have the same ring about it. That's no, it doesn't. <sighs> but I do what I can. <laughs> I do it for the people. Gab, all right. I, I don't know if it's is it Gab or Gab, Don making. I think it might be Don making strange. Maybe Don just looked at. Hey, always me. Always no, Gab. Look, I, I appreciate I, Ali's effort and solidarity, but seventy-six percent, Ali. It just doesn't. It just really doesn't sound right. I, no. I think you should just stick to, to what you've been doing all along with the 100%. Oh, because I, I'm not selfish, Gab. I'm, I'm here for the people. I'm oh. here to lift spirits. And this go. is that's what that's team true. needed today. That's, that's what I'm doing. That's Particularly what I, the, these tough times. I, when I heard those strange noises, I thought Don may have looked at himself in the mirror and thought, oh, I've completely <laughs> forgot I was on TV today. Oh, he lost, he lost his captain's armband. Oh, that's what no. It was. Oh, no. <laughs> Don, why are you dressed like that? It's freezing over here, and I'm taking measures. I don't want to be cold, so I've got layers on. So Can you put uh, layers underneath a shirt and a smart. nice jacket? Well, I've got a jumper on. I've got a couple of T-shirts on. I'm warm. I'm casual. Uh, oh, <laughs> you are casual. casual. <laughs> you are casual. <laughs> right, then. I've got the armband on underneath. Favorite... I've got Everton shirt on underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite football movie? Oh... ID is really good. If you haven't seen ID, it's not really a football movie. It's about hooliganism in the 80s. No. What do you mean, no? That's a, that's a football uh, movie. It's a st no, you know what? All right. Well, obviously, the greatest football movie is, is Escape to Victory, which sure. uh, ended mm -hmm. up in a draw. But um, Don't ruin it for people who haven't seen it. Stevie might, <laughs> uh, Stevie might know this. Uh, true. Uh, or possibly Don, since he's also Scottish. Isn't there... Um, isn't there some famous Scottish film where there's like a uh, yeah. an iconic film from the 70s with a girl Gittle. footballer or something? Yeah, Gregory's yes. Girl. Gregory's Girl. What's the premise of Gregory's Girl, Don? Uh, Gregory's Girl is a girl who's a very talented footballer, but obviously in Scotland and back in, I think, the 70s, they were just boys team only, but she was... Uh, she was sort of forced to sort of uh, tie her hair up and look more like a boy so she could play for the team, and she was, like, amazing. But it's, like, a funny, funny film. It's, it's quite iconic-like. I don't know if you guys have seen Kez. Kez oh, is, is an iconic fantastic. football film. There you go. Kez is fantastic. Well, it's not a football movie. Mm. Brilliant. Well, the best, no, but one of the best parts, and arguably the best part, has to do with the school playground playing football it is absolutely fantastic when the, when when the teacher when the teacher gets a penalty yeah he and he, thinks he's, he's, Bobby he's got a whistle he blows himself for a penalty <laughs> uh, and he misses the penalty and he blames the keeper for moving so he takes it again and obviously slots it in the bottom corner I'm, I'm ruining that for us as well now. Oh, no. Spoiler alert, it's all over the place. You, you really would laugh. Oh. Yeah. Well, fantastic. if you've not if you've not seen Kez, you, you, it should be spoiled. You should have seen Kez. <laughs> well, I have not seen it. But now it's the top of my list.
I am surprised, however, that yeah. Gab did not say kicking and screaming, where the whole premise of the movie is that the kids that are running the team are the Italians. Oh, ah, I haven't heard of that movie. What do you mean? It's with Will Ferrell? I, I have not seen that. No. Nice. You should see it. Pass it to the Italians. It? Yes. Oh. Yes. They're the this ringers is an in the team. education for all oh. of us. Oh. Well, you should. Ali, what's the chances of you watching Cares? About 76%? 76%? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't think Ali wouldn't understand the way they talk there in that broader, the broad well, he's Yorkshire. He's worked with accent. you for eight years. <laughs> I'm sure. Broad Yorkshire, broad Yorkshire. Yorkshire's harder. What's in Cornwall? I don't start with Cornwall. <laughs> we haven't produced any movies. Yeah, sure. because nobody can understand it the way you speak. Right, what else was in there? Bend it like Beckham, goals one and two. Uh huh. Huh. You, I'm looking at Steve now. Okay, Steve, you're, you're like Listen, I, I don't like that. I don't like films that have football in it because right. you can tell how false it is. It's just stupid. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sorry, I, yeah. can't, I just can't help myself. Yeah. I was people, watching the, people I, diving out the road and all this nonsense. <laughs> I was re-watching re The Sopranos, which is brilliant. There's a horrible scene, soccer oh. scene in it all, where they're just faking it all. Horrible. How do you say, Stevie? To be fair, how bad work. was Sylvester Wait. Stallone? As a goalie. <laughs> I mean, come on. Give me a break. What? <laughs> well, nearly as bad as Rodney Dangerfield as the coach in Ladybots. Oh, uh, Gab, did you want to chip in before we move on? I think you're being pretty harsh on, <laughs> on Stallone because, he was you know, a lot, oh, of the, uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of the players who played on the German team, you know, those are real footballers. Those were professional oh, footballers. Those were your fellow really? pros. And he Did kept I mention them, he, them? He kept them out as best he could. He did I see mention three goals, that? I think, or four goals. <laughs> what well, he did it's well it's to keep the... them out. He did what he could. <laughs> Shut he up. only just learned to play the game. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up. We need some sort of live At commentary least, over I'll this. tell you what. If you... I'll tell oh, you, if you're, going to, if you're going to play a part, at least look authentic. So if you're going to play a goalie, at least dive properly. He couldn't even dive properly. What goalie do you know who dives playing. up the way and then sideways? Steve, the whole premise is that he's not a goalkeeper. He's a guy who's learning on the job. It's like his second day ever playing football. He's not going to look... He's not going to look authentic. It's embarrassing. It's I just embarrassing. think you're being harsh on him. <laughs> hey, no. Hey, do, and you, the thing, <laughs> do you think they had a throwing coach in that team? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the goalie coach doubled up as a throwing coach. Gab. Didn't he? Biggest moment. <laughs> Eagles winning the Super Bowl or Italy winning the World Cup? Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Mm. All right. I'm going to go with... Italy winning the World Cup, even though, I, you know. See, Italy have been world champions four times. The Eagles have won the NFL four times. So, you know, I, I, I think that there's a nice balance there. But, um, but yeah, I'm going to go to the World Cup. Because you know what? It's all about the villains that you beat on your way to doing it. And the Eagles did overcome Tom Brady and the Cowboys. I'm oh, sorry, and the, uh, and the Patriots. And, of course, they beat the Cowboys because uh, they're in the same division. They play them every year. But, man, Italy, the two World Cups that Italy won in, their, in, in my lifetime, we got to beat the Germans twice, once in the final, once in the semifinal. And, and, and then that's pretty special. It was still on in goal for Germany, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, what are you all doing? They're close, Jens Lehmann. <laughs> Jens Lehmann and Stallone, about the same. Yeah. Apart from... Apart from watching Escape to Victory, what are you all doing to kill time in this stay-at-home period? <laughs> Dan finally learning Spanish, Stevie oh. writing a second book. By the way, I don't know, I don't know, you weren't here, but I was asking Julian, right, right. about a French detective. I will say, oh, yeah, 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 you're watching it, yes. Right? Yes. So, my business finished that one. Right. I went home the other night. Yeah. And she was on another one, a new French one with subtitles. You don't like subtitles because you no. like to walk around <laughs> when no. the TV's on for some reason. I'm like, honestly, <laughs> it, gets, uh, it gets a bit tiresome. Ah. Where you're glued to the waiting and the waiting and the words coming up on the screen. It's Why, what annoying. else would you be doing? It's annoying. You're just that. watching TV. It's annoying. It's not annoying. It is. Have you been watching French subtitles? I've movies? watched many Spanish things with subtitles <laughs> in English. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Spanish. Ooh. <laughs> uh, Don, you've, you've got, what, three-year-old twins? So that's keeping you uh, nicely yeah. occupied. 
Honestly, I am <laughs> so bored. It's untrue. Oh, dear. I went to a game shop the other day and bought Kiddies Bingo. I've been playing Bingo with the three-year-olds, which involves, like, like this little tumbler with yeah. all the balls in. Yeah, but the balls know. are like tiny little marbles, and there's, like, 90 of them. Right. And trying to keep three-year-old twins in check, putting, like, one, two, three, all in the right order, mm. and losing balls here, there, and everywhere. I reckon I've had it... I reckon I've had it four days, and I've gone from 90 balls to about 76. Yeah! Like, tell you what, you 76 balls! Yeah. You know when you're lying in bed at night, Don, can you hear all the balls going round, <laughs> round, and round, 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 round? Honestly, mate, I've got, I've got, I've got OCD, so they have to, everything has to be back in the boxes, all the, all the, all the chess pieces and all the draft oh, pieces and all, all the. Everything. Playing chess at three years old. <laughs> Torture. You must take after the mother. <laughs> I have to question his uh, <laughs> leadership skills. Yes, yeah, exactly. he's, he's a captain, right? Yeah, he's, you a, would he's, think lost, uh, he's dropped 14 balls. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm just saying, you would think that he would lead his team a little bit better than he has so what, far. What about you, Gav? What are you doing in your downtime? Well, I don't actually have that many, that much downtime because I actually have to work and write and produce podcasts as well as sit on here and talk to you guys, as you know. Um, but, it's not a real job. Uh, we've got, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we do have a courtyard with with a basketball hoop, but it's fully enclosed, and I'm told it's uh, it's okay to go out there, and it's not much fun playing against my kids because I'm substantially taller than they are, and substantially better for now, anyway. <laughs> um, so, well, you had to get the bad. I'm trying to teach myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to teach myself to to play left-handed, and to do what. When I played basketball when I was younger, which I was never allowed to do, which is which is handle the ball. Because it was kind of like, all right, you just go under the basket, get rebounds and foul people. I'm like, okay. Oh. So it's a whole new world there. And I realized there's a good reason why I was never allowed to handle the ball because it's really difficult and it takes a lot of hand-eye coordination and, you, and <laughs> it's easier to be small when you do it. But um, it's a learning process. And there's a whole bunch of wonderful uh, videos on YouTube Teaching you all sorts of uh, all sorts of tricks, which oh, Gab, you're going to have to upload do. your yeah. video of doing it. That is, that's going to entertain <laughs> us for a bit, definitely. Final one. The, forget the best goal. What's the worst goal you've ever scored? Oh. Ali, this is you've got. Yeah, a, I mean, you've this got is. A this I is, mean, this is. <laughs> I got a whole catalog. <laughs> All of them were, were terrible. Scrappiest, yeah. nastiest. He could, he could actually pull a DVD of yeah, Alex yeah. Walsh goals. Oh, yeah, yeah that, they were all within two yards. All <laughs> deadly from there. Uh, Don, is there one that uh, comes to mind? Uh, I scored one off my backside in a Merseyside derby. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't when you were captain ever on the field. <laughs> it was uh, no, it was a Goodison, and it was nil nil. And Sander Vesterveld tried to take a quick free kick, and I walked past him, and he smashed it off my backside. And as the ball rolled over the line, Graham Pohl panicked and blew for full time. Oh, Stadium yes. went absolutely mental. Oh, finished nil nil, goes that. golf. I, I forgot about that, Don. I'm going to look that up. Wait, wait a minute, oh, so, yeah. so, so it wasn't a goal after all? No, got disallowed. Oh, but it oh. should have been a goal. Stevie. No, I don't no, I just, no, I'll take just, any unless an own goals, but not, not goals are scored. No. I don't care how they go on, it's a good goal. What was the worst own goal? Oh, I chipped David James, who's 112 foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> from, from 30 yards out, away at Middlesbrough. He came running out and I lobbed it over the top of his head. It's a good finish, but yeah. wrong oh, I remember that. Did you give it my bad? Played in that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Lots, lots to talk about tomorrow. For, Frank LeBeouf will be here. 